Lately, lots of people in media have been talking about and they've been fretting over and they have been complaining about cancel culture. Now, getting a clear definition of what any particular person means about cancel culture is a whole lot harder than finding someone who's upset about cancel culture and wishes we could cancel cancel culture. Originally, I did research this week because I like to know things. Originally, the idea of canceling something comes from young black people in, in the United States who would say that they were canceling an artist or a movie that they wanted to boycott for some reason or another. It really is just a slang term for boycotting somebody. But over the past few years, it's grown into an effort, as we've seen, to kick people off of social media, to even sometimes shame companies into firing someone for doing something that others found offensive in some way that was beyond the pale, which should not be accepted in among good people anymore. But it's not actually a new or recent phenomenon in the last couple of years. It actually finds deep roots among us in the Christian community as well. It was only in 2016 that Jen Hatmaker, the prolific Christian blogger and author, had all of her books pulled from Lifeway Christian bookstores because she came out as open and affirming of LGBTQ rights. And she was canceled by the Christian bookstore industry, and they won't sell her books anymore. Or back in 2012, it was John Piper, the very influential Reformed Baptist, but Reformed, pastor who said about our neighbor at the time, Rob Bell at Mars Hill, goodbye, Rob Bell, saying that he was no longer Christian after his book Love Wins came out that seemed to imply some sort of version of universal salvation. And it was in the 80s that us Christians got really good at boycotting. Does anyone remember when they, I'm, I'm a certain age, so when I was in youth group, we had youth group meetings in which we were told that rock music was bad and we were encouraged to burn our tapes. CDs didn't exist yet, hardly. Our tapes, not eight tracks, just to not make me any older than I am. Tapes, sometimes CDs by the end of high school, right? We should burn them and we should not listen to those people. That was canceling people we didn't agree with. We would boycott them. And of course, it was 2,000 years of Christians deciding what is heresy and what is orthodox teaching, which is the ultimate cancel. You're no longer part of us because what you believe is not true, we would argue, and so they were beyond the pale and shouldn't be listened to in the church anymore. Which is a reminder, maybe, for us to consider that there are some things that shouldn't be tolerated. There are some things that are unacceptable, there are some things that do lead to a break in relationship, and maybe that's not all bad. Sometimes we should say, that is too far, that is not acceptable, that destroys the relationship I want to have with you. I suppose what really matters is what lines are you drawing to decide what behavior is appropriate and what is not. Who is included in community, who is not. And if someone is not included in community, how are you going to treat them? How do you respond to those who you think ought to be canceled in some way? As many of us are experiencing, it is difficult to live in a time where there is no longer agreement about what behavior should lead to someone being boycotted. Where things that used to be acceptable are now offensive and things that used to be offensive are now celebrated. It's hard to find our footing and know where we ought to stand. And so this morning, as we turn to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus confronts some of the poor lines that people in his day had drawn and points us to another way to think about how we ought to decide what's appropriate and what is not and how we ought to respond to those beyond the pale. But before we dig into Scripture, let's pray this morning. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe, and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning we turn to Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23 for our scripture. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, 
that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go in, into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. This whole story is a little confusing for us today. And, and actually, it was confusing in that day, too. That's why Mark has to keep explaining these traditions of the Jews, because he's writing to a predominantly Gentile audience, and they don't get what is so offensive about not washing your hands before you eat. So what is going on here? It's helpful to try to step into this story from the perspective of the Pharisees. Why do they care so much? I think there are three things that the Pharisees are trying to do, why these extra rules they have made matter so much to them. The first is this. The Pharisees have a sincere desire to help people connect to God. You see, in their day, most Jews could not go to the temple regularly. Many of them were scattered throughout the Roman Empire or beyond, and even those who lived in Galilee could not easily travel to the temple. It was a couple of times a year trip at most. And so for most of them, all year long, if following God was all about offering sacrifices in the temple, there was nothing that they could do to show that they were following God. There was nothing to keep them connected to God all year long. And so the Pharisees said, well, why don't we start applying the rules of the temple to daily life? We will be the temple of God where we are so we can stay connected to God. And so I imagine for hand washing, they turn to Exodus 30, where we read this. They're told, make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar, a, excuse me, and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall, not, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so, they, so that they will not die. And this is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. So according to the law, the priests in the temple should wash their hands every time they bring a food offering to God. 
And the Pharisees said, this is so important that we want to bring it into our daily lives. We will now wash our hands every time we eat as if it is an offering to God, this food that God has given to us. And they expected everyone to do that. And almost everybody did. It was what good Jews did in that day. The Essenes, a splinter group from the priests, the more conservative priests who fled the temple because they thought it was corrupt, took this even more seriously. They didn't just wash their hands and feet. They would strip down multiple times a day and walk into a mikvah, a big, a big bathtub basically, to bathe their whole body and then come out and dry off and then go eat. But if they touched a lower-ranking person up from the Essenes, they thought they might be defiled. They would go strip down again and go back in the tub and get washed again. And then they would be ritually pure. They took staying clean, purity, very seriously. In fact, it was such a big deal that one rabbi went to explaining to his people how important it was that you would wash your hands before you ate, said that it was just as bad to go to the temple and meet with the temple prostitutes of some false god as it was to not wash your hands before eating your food. That's not a little thing going on for them. It is a vital issue in their life together as the people of God. They... Uh, they uh, they did this to stay connected to God every day, much like, in our, much like in our lives. We don't just come to church. We want to have devotions every day, and you might meet in a small group, and you listen to worship music throughout the week. It's a way to try to make your faith infl influence all of life. And so they had these rules so everyone could stay connected to God. Second thing going on for the Pharisees is they know they're living in a hostile and pagan world. And so they want a way to say that we are separate from that. So they know we're safe. We're not being polluted by that environment. And so if we eat and if we wash hands before we eat, if we only eat certain foods, then people will know we're different and we'll know we're different and we won't be tempted to be like those evil Gentiles out there. Has anyone ever had those thoughts about life in church sometime? They'd be really good church people, wouldn't they? They want to make sure they're, they're separate from the world. And then third, they genuinely and rightly believe that following the commands of God leads to a better life. I mixed my things together in my little talk, so we're just going to go with what I wrote down and not what's up on the screen in a minute. They want to protect their identity. They want to avoid the slippery slope and lead the better life. And they honestly believe that if you follow the commands they've laid out, in addition to the 613 in the Torah, that your life will be better. That when you obey God, life goes better than when you disobey God. Who else thinks that? Raise your hand if you think obeying God is better than disobeying God. All of you should raise your hand, right? You came to church today because you think obeying God is better than disobeying God. We are right in there with the Pharisees, right? We want people to obey God because we know it leads to a better life. That's why we obey. It's healthier. It's a better way to live. We want to make sure that we're, we are living for God we're, so we separate ourselves from sinfulness in our world and we want to stay connected to God. We probably all agree with what the Pharisees are trying to do. And so when Jesus lets his disciples just start eating food without washing their hands, it is undermining everything the Pharisees are working toward. It is saying that all the things you do to make you the people of God don't matter. Their whole worldview, their whole community structure is at stake if no one has to wash their hands because then none of the rules will be followed and everything will be chaos. That is the fear. And so the Pharisees get angry. And Jesus, he decides the best way to calm things down is to call them a bunch of hypocrites. Not the best way to calm things down, but certainly to make your point. So Jesus calls them hypocrites. But we want to be careful what kind they are, because there are two kinds of hypocrites. There are some hypocrites who say, you should live this way, and then intentionally don't live that way, and they don't care. They just want you to follow the rules while they break them. Those are terrible people. You should not follow people like that. Most people are not those kind of hypocrites. Most people are hypocritical in this way. These are the rules we ought to follow. They try to follow them, and they're blind to the ways that they don't. And the Pharisees are blind to the ways that all of their rules actually keep them from having hearts that are chasing after God. They don't even know that they're hypocrites. They find the loophole. 
and their rules give people more and more loopholes to find so that they can do what they want and not have to actually follow the intention of God in the Torah. This is natural for people. We are good at finding loopholes, aren't we? If there is a rule, we look for what is the way that I can get around that rule. Take, for example, Elizabeth Sweeney. She's one of my, my loophole heroes. She was an Olympian in 2018 in Pyeongchang in China. She competed in freestyle Olympic skiing. So remember when they go down the hill and they hit bumps and they do like flips and tricks and they spin around in the air? It's like death-defying stuff, right? She competed in the Olympics in freestyle skiing. She did not do any tricks and doesn't know how to do any when she does freestyle skiing. But she wanted to be in the Olympics. And she figured out if you go down the hill without doing any tricks and don't fall, you get points. And so you could be in like a high, uh, in, in some small tournaments, near the top of the leaderboard by simply not falling on your way down the hill because everyone else will fall. And so what she did is she competed in all of the events in freestyle skiing around the world that the other good skiers didn't go to. So she'd go to events that almost no one went to. There'd be like 20 skiers, and she'd finish in the top 30 because there were 20 skiers, and she didn't fall down the hill. And she wound up with a world ranking that qualified her to be in the Olympics. Except she was an American. And as an American, we have a lot of freestyle skiers because we made the sport so we could get more people in Olympics and win more good medals. And so she didn't qualify for the U.S. Olympic freestyle skiing team. So she couldn't go to the Olympics. And then she thought, wait a minute, my grandparents were Hungarian. And the Hungarians don't have an Olympic freestyle skiing team. So she signed up as a Hungarian to compete in the Olympics as a freestyle skier when she did not know how to, how to freestyle ski and was not Hungarian but she got to go in the Olympics. Isn't that a great story? Talk about finding the loopholes, right? That is really, like, honestly, I'm kind of impressed. I'd want to be in the Olympics too, and I bet I could ski downhill. Never mind, I couldn't ski downhill and not fall, but she did, and I'm kind of impressed with her loophole finding skills. But that's what we're good at when we're given lots of rules. If you've ever had children, you know the more rules you give them, the more loopholes that they find because we're good at it. And so Jesus points out to the Pharisees one of their loopholes that they have found or unintentionally created. He points out how their rules allow them to not follow the commands of Torah. One of the most important commands in the Torah comes from the Ten Commandments, that you should honor your father and your mother. All of you parents here are like, that is the most important command I can think of at this very moment, now that Pastor Greg said kids find the loophole. You should honor your father and your mother, Right? For the Jews, as they reflected on what it meant to honor your father and mother, they came up with two key things that it meant. First, you should not disagree with your parents in public. You should, even if they have stupid opinions, you should not contradict them in public. It's disrespectful to your elders, so just let them have their dumb opinion, and then you can talk about it in private. That was the first rule. Second rule was you had to provide for your parents' needs when they got older. In a world that did not have Medicare and Social Security, where everyone did physical labor, as you got older, you were not able to make enough food to provide for yourself anymore. You needed someone to provide. That is your children's job. So everything you have as a child, when you're an adult, is available for your parents to meet their basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter, because that's what it means to honor your father and your mother. Except, except... If you dedicate your possessions to God, as in someday later you will give them to God, like when you die, now you can't give them to anyone else because it's been dedicated to God when you die, so you no longer are obligated. In fact, you may not help your mother and father. You have to keep all your money for yourself until you die because you dedicated it to God. Now, that's a great loophole if you're mad at mom and dad, isn't it? And they found a way to avoid a basic command of Torah by dedicating everything to God, but not actually giving it to him. Isn't that great? People find ways to avoid being obedient to God now, and they did 2,000 years ago too. And so Jesus points out, that's a loophole that you find and you violate the commands of God. Because rules always lead to loopholes unless your heart is dedicated to actually following God. So when you spend enough time, you will always find the loophole that lets you look good 
while doing exactly what you want. And the Pharisees did. So Jesus says what matters in our lives is not how good we are at following the rules, but our hearts, our motivations, those things that lead to the action in our lives. It's not how good we are at washing our hands, it's whether we have a heart that is fully devoted to God. So Jesus says we should worry less about those external rules and more about our hearts. Because our hearts are what reveals the true character, the true nature of who we are. It's our heart that's either pure or impure. It's either devoted to God or not devoted to God. And that's what matters. Jesus says you can tell someone's heart by what comes out of their life. In Mark 7, 20, he says this from the end of our passage. He says, this is what you see. You see sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and greed and malice and deceit and lewdness and envy and slander and arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. They are not religious rules. They're just immoral, revealing your impure heart. You can wash your hands all you want. If you don't, mess, you don't change your heart, you're still that person who's impure. And this is what God is worried about in our lives. God is not worried about what kind of clothes you wear to church or what kind of songs you sing or whether you listen to the right Christian station on the radio when you're driving in your car. God's not worried about that. God's worried about your heart. Do our hearts reveal evil intent or a heart that's fully devoted to following God? Paul describes the fruit of a good heart this way in Galatians 5. He says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. If you have a heart like that, you don't have to worry about violating the commands of God because you won't. Everything you do will be in accordance to the will of God because your heart is pure and devoted to Him if it has that fruit coming out of it. So as you look at your life, is that the fruit you see? Love, joy, peace, forbearance. I love the word forbearance. It's a change in the, in the, in the recent NIV. It used to be patience. But forbearance implies that someone is really annoying and you keep putting up with them. You forbear with the person who's annoying and offending you a little bit every single day. They keep poking at you, and you just forbear and love them anyway. I love that word. Way better than patience, because that implies when I tap my foot at Myers that I'm... The checkout line is really slow at Myers. It's one of my pet peeves in life. It's my lack of forbearance for people who aren't fast in the checkout line. I love the word forbearance. So, do you have forbearance in your life? For the, for the Pharisees, these rules are their marks of who is in the people of God. For Jesus, he says, those are the wrong marks. All of those, all those rules you have aren't the right marks. It's what kind of heart do they have? Is it fully dedicated to God? That's the mark that matters. Let me ask you, in your life, what are the marks of following God that really matter to you? What are the marks of God that you're trying to disciple in your children if you have them in your house? What are the marks that you're trying to, 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 Im, to impute, to put into the person that you're mentoring in your life? How would you know that your discipling of someone was successful? What would be the signs of that in their life so that you would know? I was thinking about that this week, thinking about when I was a kid growing up. I grew up in Zealand. I love Zealand, by the way. It is the coolest little one-block town town. I like Zealand. And I loved growing up at Zealand Christian. So I went to Zealand Christian. I was thinking about when I was a kid, these are the marks that I would have pointed to, not because they're the ones adults would have had, but as a kid, this is what I perceived. That the good Christian people sent their kids to Christian school because everyone I knew sent their kids to Christian school. We didn't play with public school kids in my neighborhood. There were enough Christian school kids we didn't have to, I guess. I don't know. But we didn't. Um, so they went to Christian school, and they went to the right kind of church that sang, sang, sang the right kind of songs. This was a big deal in my house. My mom was involved in the CRC in some form with like the gray Salter hymnal that came out in the late 80s. And so like singing the right music mattered in my high class cultured home that listened to European like highbrow music all the time. Don't ask about contemporary music in my mom's head. She's grown a lot, but it was a long road for her. Um, so it was the right kind of music and you had the right theology, right? You had to think the right things about God. Those are the things I would have thought about. And I'm, none of those are necessarily bad. I love Christian schools. Some of my favorite people are Christian school teachers. My closest friend is a Christian school teacher. I love him dearly. There are great things go on there. Um, 
but that wouldn't be on my list anymore, right? It's a good thing, but it's not on my list of the marks. What would be the marks? Well, more and more, I, I hope that the things I'd look for are people gentle and kind and generous and are they patient with one another and are they joyful? I hope that's the fruit of the Spirit I look for. But then I started thinking, well, what are the marks that Jesus looks for? Because in the end, it doesn't really matter what I look for in someone who's following Jesus. What does Jesus want in my life? What are his marks of someone who's part of his family or not? And now I'm going to tread really carefully, so let me say some things before anyone gets mad at the end. All right? So let me say this. First, I'm with Paul, because Paul, by the way, if you read Romans and Galatians, the debate in those books is all about what are the marks of being in the family of God. And Paul says over and over again, it's not following the law, it's faith in Jesus. I'm with Paul. It's about faith in Jesus. We are saved, not by our goodness, not by our faithfulness, but by Jesus' goodness and his faithfulness. I will sing that song to the day I die. I am saved only by grace, and praise God for that, and so are you. So we are not, I'm not messing with that. Don't hear me say that, okay? In fact, I would argue that even in our passage today, that's part of where Jesus is going for his disciples, because right after our passage from today, Jesus meets a woman a Syrophoenician or a Canaanite woman who's an enemy of the people of God who asks for help for her daughter. And Jesus seems to test his disciples. Will they argue that she could be part of the kingdom because she is trusting Jesus or not? And his disciples agree that ah, she shouldn't come. We don't want her around. And, she, and then finally she convinces everyone that she can be helped too and her daughter gets healed. And the next place Jesus goes is to the southeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. If you remember our map from a couple weeks ago, what's in the southeast corner of the Sea of Galilee? The Decapolis. Ten Gentile cities. There's not a Jew in sight. Everyone is an enemy of the people of God. And Jesus goes there and proclaims the kingdom and invites them to be a part of it too. For Jesus, the key criteria is do you put your trust in Jesus or not? Not whether or not you follow all of the other rules. So I want to stand with Jesus and Paul, and I want to end right there, because that's, I mean, any sermon that ends with you are saved by Jesus and faith in him alone is a great sermon. That's the best place to end. So we're going to end there, and I'm going to skip the hard part. Except then I feel bad, because every day when I pray before, especially on Sundays, I pray, God, let me say what you want people to hear, not what I want to say, and especially if I'm scared. So that's, I try to say the stuff that will make you kind of tense when we're done. Now I'm overbuilding this. It's not that big of a deal. But this is interesting. When Jesus tells us what his marks are, well, we find that in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of the sheep and the goats. And in the beginning of the parable, he says that the king is going to come, and he will separate the sheep from the goats. And Jesus is the king. It's when he comes back to judge all people at all times. That is clearly the point of the parable. And then the king, the king says this, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, we got to keep going, thank you. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the sheep, as the story goes on, say, when did we ever do this? We never did any of that for you. And the king says, every time you did, want, you did something like that for the least of these, you did it for me. The one time Jesus says what he's looking for as a sign that you're one of his disciples, it seems to be, how do you care for the people that our world puts down? Do you lift them up? How do you care for the people that our world wants to push to the side? Do you include them in? How do you care for the people that our world wants to treat as less than human? Do you call out for their human, for the humanity? How do we respond to the people that our world treats as less than? Do we lift them up or do we join the world in putting them down? Makes me wonder if maybe the way that we show that we're followers of Jesus is not by coming to church every week, though I'm glad you're all here today. It's so good to see so many of you. And it is not even by having devotions every day, though I think you should because it will help you grow closer to Jesus. I think if you're in his word, you'll know what he thinks. And it's not even by praying every day, though I'm all for praying every day because that's when the Spirit starts speaking to me. You got to pray every day. But the marks that you're following him well are not those things, 
It's not even that you're staying separate from the world and no one ever sees you do anything wrong. It's not that. It's are you embracing the broken and the beat down in our world with the same gentle kindness and mercy that God has shown you in Jesus? This is what it means to be a follower of God. What I love about our church is that I see that in so many of you week after week and year after year. I was struck by that again on Friday. This is my end. I will end because we're after 10 and we're going to go late now because I get excited about y'all. Um, but it was so fun to see so many of you come through the line for the spaghetti dinner and see people just give so freely. Um, and people have been calling in asking what they can do to care for, for Ruby's family. Um, keep being those people. Be the people who see the one who's hurting and say, I'm going to come alongside and help because that's who our God is and that's how he said, that's how he said, that's what he says he looks for in his disciples. Are you that kind of person? May you continue to be them each day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are not often the people you've called us to be, that we can be selfish and, and focused on our own needs and interests. We can be so busy in our lives that we miss those you have put in our path who are hurting and struggling. And so we ask that you would give us eyes to see and that in our life we might bear the marks of your kingdom, that we might lift up those who are down, that we might bind up the broken, that we might welcome the outcast into our midst, and in this place they might meet the God who loves and delights in them. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.